Welcome back to Two Cents, everybody. My name is John Malasa, and I want to give a little warning before I get started in this video. This Two Cents contains my personal preference for film, so don't kill me if you disagree. This beginning is just my opinion. That being said, I don't really like action movies. Now, let me explain this comment. I don't like action movies. I like movies with action in that order. So when I watch Die Hard, I'm not looking at Bruce Willis beating up bad guys. I'm looking at the delivery of lines, the motivation to save his girl, and Hans Gruber's plan. These are the elements of the film that I look at and enjoy, and while I love a great fight scene, there are very few action scenes that can get my heart pumping enough to forgive a bad film with shitty characters. Now here's the part you'll hate me for, but again, just personal taste. 300, Transformers, the Michael Bay, basically anything, Ninja Turtles, whatever have you, they all bored me to death. These movies' heart-pounding action did nothing for me. But there are a few gems that get me going to a film again and again just for thrills. I can watch the end of Sword of the Stranger, the Rock Lee vs. Gara fight, Jackie Chan, anything, and Rocky. These movies and shows manage to suck me in. But why? How? How does a film or writing get even the most action-averted heart pumping? And what film does this the best? For this, I turn to the heart-pumping, nail-biting, pulse-pounding, racing fury that is Redline. Now, Redline is a racing film I know, but the general principles can be applied to any action-centric film. Stick with me on this premise, I promise you, you won't be disappointed. So grab your hair gel, your leather jacket, and fire up your Trans Am, because you're going for a ride. Redline is the story of Sweet JP as he chases down his dream of becoming the best racer and winning the Red Line. What's the Red Line, you ask? Imagine a race, except it's on an alien planet. Now imagine that planet was harboring illegal biological weapons that they didn't want discovered. So that planet, Robo World's government, decides to throw a cybernetic army at the racers. Now imagine those racers are dropping into the battlefield slash racetrack from high orbit. This is the definition of awesome and badass. But how does Redline execute on this premise? I mean, Speed Racer was over the top, but left a lot to be desired. Why does Redline work? Redline accomplishes this by five means. One, taking a break from the action. Two, the use of cuts during action scenes. Three, the motion of the animation and cinematography. Fourth, the design. And fifth, the disregard for anything else but the essentials. So starting off, number one, taking a break from the action. Redline knows how to take its time. The movie's about characters who are racing. So while Redline opens with a 10 minute race to hook the audience, after that, there's almost an hour of downtime. Racers are introduced, the world is fleshed out, and the audience can have a breather to get to care about these characters. So, ready for a generalized statements about action movies? This is the problem with every bad action movie. That's why I have it first on the list. When you think of Die Hard, why does it work? It's because Bruce Willis beats up people, right? No, it's because he's an aggressively balding guy who could literally be killed. He's a human character. Each fight he takes on feels real because we see the blood and sweat of combat. We're invested in Die Hard for everything but the action. Action is just the final product of the conflict. But if a proper conflict doesn't exist and there are no stakes, why would your audience care? Redline takes the time not just to develop the plot, but to develop characters. So when the action comes, we're right in the driver's seat with JP, rooting for him to win the race. 
Number 2, the use of cuts. Let me show you an action scene from The Last Airbender versus a scene from The Forbidden Kingdom. Now, both these films are about unrealistic kung fu fighting with magic powers, but look at the battles and tell me the difference. In one, the character is perfect, and in the other, the character is thinking, and failing, and solving problems. What I enjoy about Jackie Chan's work is that we see his thought process as he deals with navigating a fight, as opposed to just taking one on. Now, why do I mention the use of cuts? Well, in Redline, we're racing. We essentially have two dimensions to any driving scene. One is the driver in a battle of the mind, while their car is actually racing on the track. What I like about good racing movies is that they mimic a good action scene with the use of hard cuts as opposed to nuanced moments in combat. Think of it this way. Every time the race cuts from the outside of the car to the driver's seat, Imagine that as a moment of thinking versus a moment of action. When there are racers way out in the lead, we'll rarely see inside their car, but when they're neck and neck, we'll see every step of their thought process to navigate their way to victory. At the same time, if a fight is one-sided in an action film, we likely won't see the fighters struggle or attempt to coordinate their movements, but if the fighters are evenly matched, we see the struggle, thinking, and bouts of emotion intermittent with combat. Take a moment from Redline and look at the cut. He's making a break for the lead on the rocket ride as he pulls away from the second group. Brad Sonnachy riding hard, holding a position at the head of the pack. You better watch out though, because JP's Trans Am is going to fast on the tail. Driver 1, to Driver 2, back to JP, back to Driver 1, back to the car, back to JP, back to Driver 2, and then back to JP, ultimately to go back to the drivers. All the cuts are a handful of seconds long, if even that long, but it conveys the conflict, tension, and success of the racer and failure of the others. Let's compare that scene to a scene from The Bourne Identity, another film with compelling action sets. In the scene, after a little tussle, Jason Bourne and the French assassin back off for a moment. The bad guy pulls out a hidden metal spike and attempts to kill Bourne with it. Now this scene will happen quickly, but notice the focus of the shots. I'll break them down for you in a moment. First, we start with a shot of the spike, then the girl screaming to look out. 
Then we go to a shot of both, indicating that Jason is now keeping his distance from the opponent. The two tussle, then back to a distance as they're thinking of what to do next. Back on the knife as Jason attempts to disarm him, only to fail. Finding a new strategy, we see him feel around on the desk for a pin and stab his opponent. In a few short moves, the fight is over. The two movies are the same. We're going from cockpit to race, back to cockpit, and so on. Showing your fighters, or racers, negotiating an issue makes the action more intriguing, especially because neither of these scenes hold heavy narrative weight. Both the racers and the assassin are basic one-off villains to show how good our protagonist is, so making the combat a puzzle intrigues the fans, instead of just being a boring set piece. Compare that idea to, say, Michael Bay's Transformers movies. I mean, there's a lot of spectacle, but that's pretty much it. No substance. Make sure your characters are thinking, and that we as the audience are inside their heads. Number three, the cinematography. We want to feel like we're in the action. Intrinsic problems with racing films are that they're all over the place, which is why they're so rarely made. Think about it. Your heroes are essentially sitting still, and comparatively to the speed of the other cars, they aren't really moving that fast. You're maybe going 10 miles an hour faster than your opponent at any given time. Think about watching NASCAR. It's not exactly heart-pounding action worthy of film. But have you ever been around an actual muscle car? It is a very visceral experience. The smoke, the roar of the engine, the feel of control and freedom. These are what the writers have to convey to the viewers or readers. We need power. And there are a few cinematic tricks that Redline uses to convey the raw emotion of racing. First is the reaction to motion. The characters are clenching their teeth, bouncing around in the camera's field of view. At any moment you know they could be torn from the car and ripped out into oblivion. The feel of reckless abandon is never lost as the cars are almost shaking under their own power. Someone's having doubts, huh? Hell, I'm just trying to keep this thing interesting. You can't write me off like that. You're just a voice, pal. You don't know a damn thing about racing! Second, elongation and distortion of the composition. How fast are they going in this scene? Fast enough to have what looks like a spiritual experience. Third is the silence. There are rare moments that the film focuses on a part of the track that no cars are driving on. The finish line they have to reach or a shot of the spectators. Why? These scenes seem random, but they're probably the most important cinematic trick we as the audience need perspective on how different the racer's speed is from the pace of everything else. The racers then fly by and we see the spectators ripped from their seat and thrown by the sheer momentum of the cars. But this can be applied to any action film. Anime has this idea in the bag. Watching spectators react in awe is kind of like half the fight's runtime. Actions rises and we see the crowd explode for their favorite heroes. Nobody but nobody intimidates the mighty Nappa! Oh, what? How? How did he do that? How'd you get back there? You. You! You know, as much as you puffed yourself up, I'm kind of disappointed. Oh, uh, what did you say? Are you, are you trying to tell me I'm all bark and no bite? If that flailing around was your idea of an attack, then yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh really? Then maybe you should teach me a thing or two. Speed, strength, and the roar of power? They're silly, but they get us jazzed up for a round of action. And having the outsiders marvel at your hero's abilities is a hell of a ride. Fourth, the design. 
Understanding that action needs to be fluid, and at times fantastical, means that the designs of the characters need to fit that style of action. If your action scene is flowing and pretty, then the characters need to be long and full of cascading colors and fluid motion. Whereas if your action needs, scene needs to be gritty and realistic, the more technically accurate, the better. Think about Tom and Jerry and their physics. Well, I think Tom and Jerry have a good time firing cannons at each other at point-blank range. There's a kind of rubbery design to the characters that let us know that they're gonna bounce right back. And as far as a kid's show goes, this works great. The characters aren't bloodstains on a wall somewhere in someone's home. This style would never work for something like Sword of the Stranger. In this film, we need to understand the technical prowess of the fighters to build proper tension. Thus, having rubbery physics would ruin the show. I make this point to say that realistic isn't always better. Different strokes for different folks, as they say. So, how does Redline capture the feel of the crazy chaotic speed of interstellar racing? Well, they make their designs as crazy and chaotic as the idea. Look at the racers in their cars. To list just a few, we have a cop with the appearance of a yeti. We have the two outlaws the cop previously captured who are driving a giant bug. There's a crab car that drives on the water, a knockoff of Captain Falcon, and a giant robot who's built into his car and owns a purse dog. And of course, we can't forget Super Bowen, two strippers who pilot their car from the literal breasts of the vehicle. The designs let you know that the movie is not about the technical aspects of racing, but rather it's about the feeling of freedom and self-expression surrounding the creation and racing of vehicles. This is much closer to Grease or Speed Racer than it is to NASCAR or horse racing. No rules, no regulations, this is an anything goes Grand Prix like Mad Max, but with a future design instead of desert punk. So why not focus on the technical aspects? Well, we want our cars to be fluid in the situation. I mean, how much damage these cars take, we need the suspense of disbelief provided by the crazy designs to even have the idea that they'd hold together at all under such circumstances. JP's car is peeled open like a banana and keeps functioning just fine. Look, this makes zero sense, but you know what? Nobody cares. That's not the point of the race. Is JP going to win? Of course, but it's the wacky adventure of getting there. Now, a common saying is that a show can be style over substance, but I disagree. Style is a part of the substance. There is no red line without the unique vision of the world, from the crazy cars to the crazier people piloting them. Fifth, the disregard for anything else. So what do I mean by this? There is no fluff in a good action film. Every piece of the movie works towards a single goal. No moment of a great story should be wasted. So how do I square that with Redline having 45 minutes of downtime in the middle of the film? Between two heart-pounding races? Well, as I addressed earlier, this makes us fall in love with the characters and the zany world. We establish the strange political turmoil of the robo-world to legal bioweapons, that Satoshi has a steam light, backgrounds on all the characters, Frisbee's connection to the mob, and so on. And every scene further immerses us into the crazy and chaotic concept that is Redline. So when the final race comes around, we're in a good mindset for a bit of senseless action and violence. So what's not essential? Imagine if you had a movie about spiritual monk warriors in a fictional futuristic setting, trying to find a messiah figure to bring balance to cosmic forces. Sounds pretty interesting, right? You know what a battle with deep spiritual overtones needs? Confusing politics! Why focus on the complex relations between Jedi Knights when we could hear about trade embargoes? Yeah, see how the plot doesn't build towards its themes or actions? Hmm, I wonder if there's another film in this same series that does that. But John, what about world building? Look, world building is in service of the plot. The Matrix does a lot of world building because it's called The Matrix. It's about the idea of a weird world hiding in plain sight underneath our own. We have to understand the complex inner workings of this strange environment because that's the hook. But notice what we don't get. Information about Neo's mom or family. He's an archetypical self-insert character, so a complex background beyond his computer skills 
is unnecessary for the action-driven plot. To write compelling action, we need to understand the things that we don't need as much as the things that we do need, if we want to keep an audience or reader engaged in the conflict. So, let's recap. Number one, take a break from the action to let the story breathe and to let the conflict sink in. Two, show your hero thinking and negotiating a situation. Get your audience or your readers into the uh, combatant's head. Third, use cinematic tricks to build up the awe factor of your composition. Fourth, make sure the design complements the world you're trying to create. And fifth, stick to those essentials. A story needs zero fluff if you want to engage the audience. Redline teaches us these lessons, but they can be applied to any high action film. And if more films follow these rules, go see more of them. I once heard someone say that big budget films were killing the indie film industry because a writer needed to match the CGI of a film. But you don't really need to be flashy, that's actually probably the least important part of the equation. Well, that's my two cents. This is John Malasa. Please like and subscribe our videos and hit that little notification bell to know when we update. Do you like Redline? Do you hate it? Do you have some third opinion that no one will care about? Please continue the conversation below and give me advice on any other two cents videos that you'd like to see.